Hello everyone out there in podcast land. This is Severin Henderson back again with another episode of Department 3C Presents. Hey podcast, um, I have a guest today that is was um, one of my co-workers. Um, he's a really good, great, inspirational, positive guy and he has like a super story that he said he was going to share with us today. Um, kind of the theme of this episode is life outside of fire, life without fire, things like that. Because even though we're at work and we're working and sometimes we think we're invincible, we can do anything, we can conquer the world. Sometimes situations arise where that is not the case. Um, the big thing about this show and about the podcast is just the fact that Everyone has those moments and points of vulnerability, and that's, again, anytime someone asks me why I decided to do this show, why I started this show, that was the number one reason. I just wanted to people to know that it was okay to feel how you feel and have the things go on that happen in your life, and you are not the only one that these things happen to. I was a case of that, and as we go on with the show, we'll talk more and more about it. Um, so today we're trying a few different things out, a different format, a different way to talk to the guest. I'm doing an IG live that I hope is going through that people can see, just trying to do some cool experiments. So that was just a little mini monologue about what the episode is about and who you have to um, listen to on this episode. But this is my friend, Mike Spencer, and Mike is going to introduce himself and let's let's talk, bud. All right. Uh, <clears throat> first and foremost, thank you so much for doing what you're doing with this. And uh, I mean, obviously, I'm honored and floored that you asked me to be on this as well uh, to tell this story. It's kind of wild, you know, mm-hmm. um, and I appreciate it. I appreciate any time anybody wants to kind of like shed light on, you know, being positive and, you know, that we all sometimes need help, that we need to talk about things and, you know, talk through things and, be, excuse me, be there for each other. So I just want to say thank you very much, man. You are. Uh, hey, thank you. That's what I said when I reached out to you. You said, thank you so much for letting me come. No, yeah. thank you for coming on because trying to wrangle you guests is something else. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And yeah, schedules and Corona and the Rona. All that other yeah. fun stuff happening. So it makes yeah. it a little difficult. So, um. Like I said, the n- number one reason I wanted you to come on is because of your positivity and how up in you are that like your social media presence is just off the charts. You 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 look great. You sound great. You put up great stuff. You was just talking about a couple of your projects. So just start with who you are. Sure. Uh, and thank you so much, because like we talked about before, like obviously the, that that is something I want to get out there is positivity and happiness and, you know, doing things and getting through days and stuff like that. Uh, so it's cool to see or to hear from you that that's kind of coming through my social media posts and stuff because um, it's important. You know, it's important. So, um, you know, for my entire life, let's just get rolling in the story. Right. Yep. So, uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty wild story. And, uh, f- from the get go, from the beginning, I always wanted to be a Chicago firefighter paramedic. Like that's all I ever want to do. My father was on the job. So I looked up to him and that was it. Right. So, uh, that was my goal. That was my mission in life. I had no plan B. Uh, it was plan A and that's it. You know, um, Starting off in the career, I mean, like even before that, I got accepted to a very good college, uh, the University of Iowa. I went to the University of Iowa uh, because I just figured, like, you know, it's what to do to get your degree, you know, whatever this and that. I went there and it just wasn't for me. College okay. life was just, you know, I knew what I wanted to do. So I came home 18 years old. I was in EMT school, 19 years old. I was in paramedic school at 20 years old. I was a paramedic i got hired on my first fire department through uh, a company called pssi i was on rosemont fire department i thought it was great right like i'm starting my dream i'm starting my career um and but still my goal was chicago Mm -hmm. so i did five years on rosemont uh became a firefighter at 23 so i was firefighter paramedic coming onto the job i got started the process with chicago um, on the EMS side, I got hired at 25 on uh, as a paramedic, as okay. an FPM, and I thought to myself, I made it. 
Mm-hmm. Got on my dream job, got on my dream career. I'm on the Chicago Fire Department, you know, donning that uniform, going through graduation was one of the best days of my life, right? Mm -hmm. um, took the 2006 test. Um, my processing number on the 2006 test was incredible. It was like 234 out of 24,000 people. I was blown away. So I actually crossed over onto the fire suppression and rescue side uh, faster than I did. I would have been on my seniority side. Okay. So now... <clears throat> Uh, you know, within a couple of years, like three years uh, on uh, the EMS side, I got, I crossed over onto the fire side. So now my career, my dream has truly come true. Now I'm a firefighter paramedic on the Chicago Fire Department. Out of the academy, I got assigned to the west side where I fortunately was able to meet you. Uh, you know, I was assigned to Engine Company 117, which is a dream spot. I dream mean, spot. It's it's like I don't I don't mean to brag or whatever, but no, you brag, know, brag. I have <laughs> we want that. You know what I mean? Like it's it's a spot where only a few fire departments in the nation get to see the work that we do and get to do what we do. You know, I have a ton of friends on suburban fire departments that, you know, I, I got to rub it in their face every day that we're, you know, running into burning buildings and, you know, just doing everything and especially being a paramedic on an ALS company. Um it was just awesome, man. So we saw uh, we saw everything, you know. That was truly, truly my dream. And I, you know, being, you know, young, under 30 still, uh, you know, I think uh, a lot of it, I, I got enthralled in the life of the firefighter and, and especially the Chicago firefighter. And I felt like you touched earlier, I felt like I was invincible. I felt like I was, you know, nothing could stop me. And oh boy, did uh, the universe have a different plan for me. <laughs> um, so uh, we can fast forward uh, to no, we got time. We don't well, got to fast forward. I thought, well, let, let's sit here in this 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 moment just a little bit because I wanted to ask you a few questions. Yeah, of course. Yeah, because um, this is like the first time like we talked and hang, hung out, especially at parties and everything. Sure. But I never realized how close your story mirrored mine as far as getting hired and, and ages and everything. Right, right. So um, you said you went to the University of Iowa and it wasn't for you. What were you going to, what were you, what was your plan to major in at the time? Uh, I had no plan. Okay, so you were just there. <laughs> I, you know what, I was there. I went into sports medicine because I, I knew Ultimately, I wanted to become a paramedic, and I knew that maybe if I got some type of base uh, knowledge of the human body, it would, be, it would be smart. But I'll be honest, when I was picking my classes out, one of my classes was rugby. So <laughs> I, I can I got, see that for you, too. Yeah, yeah, I got, like, that was legitimately, I went to class one day, and it was rugby class, and, like, the, you know, the guys on the team were the teachers, and you know what I mean? Like, it was just, we did, um, I mean, I'm still... I'm still friends with a couple guys on my floor uh, from, I was in, Bur excuse me, Burge Hall uh, was the, the dorm that I was in. And uh, I mean, we all bonded so quick and it was, it was stupid. We partied every night. Mm -hmm. We were in trouble with like the floor PAs or RAs or whoever they were like the second night from causing trouble and, and, and noise. I mean, there was something, you know, I don't want to get anybody in trouble or whatever, but there was something in, in University of Iowa's, you went to this one little like uh, storefront, you pay them X amount of money per month and they give you all of the, uh, your instructors or the teacher's notes. Okay. So you didn't have to go to lectures. You just okay. showed up, got your notes for the week well, we, and stuff. We, we like, know that. You're not getting. Yeah. I don't, I'm just, like, I don't know. Who knows what's as long, out there. As long as we don't know I'm that guy or that I don't know, girl. I'm not saying any names, you know. I'm, there you so, go. But uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there's crazy stuff Say out no there names. now. Say no names. I'm with that. Yeah. <laughs> so. It was kind of like, I mean, after a couple months there, I realized that I'm not doing anything but wasting my mom's money. And my yes. mom, um, you know, divorced mom, she didn't have a lot of money uh, growing up. You know, she was, you know, I mean, she worked so hard for such, you know, to, to raise my sister and I uh, on, on so little, with so little help, you know, that... I realized that, you know, this just isn't right. Just mm -hmm. to get a degree when I when I want to go into a profession that I know at that time you didn't need a degree, right. I just felt it was being selfish on my part. So I called my mom and said, uh, you know, I think it's time time to come home. And, you know, she, I think she kind of understood. You know, she, 
my entire life, she always wanted a different plan for me. Um, as crazy as it is, she actually wanted me to follow art, which is funny how the world works, man. Yes, we will get it's, there. It's, yeah, yeah, we'll get, <laughs> we will get there. We will get there, right? But it's, um, yeah, my mom never wanted me to be a firefighter. She never wanted me to be on Chicago. Uh, she always wanted me to do something different or something else with my life. And, uh, you know, so when I told her that I wanted to come home and pursue, you know, get into EMT school, get into paramedic school, I knew she was upset, but I knew she also probably realized like, this is the best thing for me. Right. Um, I don't want to say I'm stubborn, but I'm stubborn. And, you know, she knew that if that was my, what my heart is set on, you know, I'm going to go after it. I'm going to go for it. So I ended up coming home from Iowa after a couple months, you know, a couple incredibly, incredibly fun months, but, uh, with no, you know, education added so to those months. There's another show I used to listen to and it's just a saying, but you were just off up in college. Yeah. You were just, yeah. just it was, there. <laughs> I, I was there. I yeah. was there. You it was just uh, hanging out. I mean, I still remember, you know, vividly some of the nights and some of the times they were there. I mean, it was awesome couple of months, but there was really no point for me to be there. You know, now looking back, you know, as this, all this stuff, you know, as we'll get through, you know, it's, it's crazy to, to be 40 now. You know, I turned 40 a couple of weeks ago, turned 40. Happy with, belated. Thanks you very much. Thank you. Uh, with no college degree, you know, because there's people with Northwestern college degrees that are, you know, working jobs at, they're way overqualified for, you know? Yeah. So to be yeah. in the position that I'm in now with no college degree is pretty wild. You know, it's pretty, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate and lucky um, that I, that I was able to kind of sidestep that at the time. But at the time it was right. It was right to do that. It was right to come home. It was right to go into EMT and paramedic school. And, um, you know, it's looking back, uh, there's always time for an education. I could go to college now if I want. Yeah, you can. Now you can be the old guy off up in right, college. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, I can say old guy because I'm old guy too. Yeah, we we the same. We're yeah. the same age. I so, couldn't imagine being in a class with 18 year olds right now. I so, trying to study. No, uh, uh, I'll go online if I do. And, and then they like know all these super secret study tricks and yeah, everything. No, and uh, there's a movie about that. I can't think of what it is, but. So, no, the intern. It wasn't. They, oh, okay. they weren't in college. They were intern. But mm -hmm. didn't Rodney Dangerfield go to college? I think old so, or something yeah. like that. Uh -huh. But um, the the thing I was gonna say, I had a similar experience. But we, my mother, couldn't afford for me to go at all. Um, I got, I applied to and got accepted to the university, uh, the Ohio State University. I almost said it wrong, like mm -hmm. um, one of the football players. Yeah, don't don't mess that up. Don't mess it up. <laughs> I did get accepted, but when it came time financing wise to pay for it, my mother was like, "What are you really going here right. for? You right. know what you want to do, right? And right, we can't afford it. exactly, this. yeah, yeah. So I, I never, I never had the opportunity to go. So that's my claim to fame, getting um, accepted. accepted least, yeah. yeah, it's still big. That's still important, man. You know, it was, it was cool enough. Yeah. But then I did go to college, um, to Cleveland State because from Cleveland, and it was just a university there. And again, I didn't even know what I was going for. Right. The other place I applied was University of Cincinnati for communications. Okay. So, like, at least I had a plan. But at the right. same time, I just wanted to be a fireman. Right. And right. I kept hearing from other people, especially like school counselors and everything, that you, okay, you want to be a fireman. That's cool. That's great. But you need to have another skill set to right. go along yep. with that. 100%. Yeah. And yeah. I wasn't really on it. I was nope. like, fireman, fun. Yep. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Same thing with me. Like I, So when I was on Rosemont Fire Department, uh, I was going to Harper College out in Palatine. It's a community college. It's an amazing school. Um, and I was going for a fire science degree. So mm -hmm. I got about, uh, I'm like six hours short of my associates in fire science uh, out of Harper, but that's when the city called and I kind of dropped everything because yep. it's like, well, sh you know, I don't need uh, education anymore because now I'm on big time now. I'm yeah. on Chicago Fire Department now. Yeah. So I would like to maybe go back and finish that up, clean that up, just to say I have an associate's, possibly go into a bachelor's, you know? Yeah. Kind of uh, in the beginnings of a new career now that probably would be wise to go get a bachelor's in, in some type of management, safety management, something Absolutely. like that. Um, but yeah, I'm the same way. Like I, you know, I kind of, I don't know. It was kind of the thing to do, you know, like you just go to college after high school and then you get your degree and then you go in your profession. But you know, it just wasn't uh, my game plan. Like I knew what I wanted and that was it. That was all I wanted to go for. So 
Yeah, we have real similar. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like as that. far as yeah. yep, as far as that goes. So <clears throat> now, I still don't want you to fast forward, but let's just push play. All right. All right. <laughs> let's get to um where we were at. So we're hired on Chicago. We got to cross a little bit earlier because we came on a civilian. Our numbers were even close right. too because I was um two seventy one because I remember because that's a major highway um back in Ohio. Oh, for real? So that's I, awesome. I remember my number. That's how yeah. I remember my number. But um. And they always said that number don't mean nothing. It don't. I'm, yeah. When I I remember when I first got the card saying what it was, I'm like, oh well, that's interesting. And it just sat on my refrigerator right. for, for some years. And then yeah. one day I woke up and had this interest card, and it was on from there. That's so, awesome. Like I said, you um worked on the Ambo for about three years, crossed over, go to one seventeen. Let's let's go from there. Yeah. So I mean, like you know. Life Same is thing sweet. with you. It's amazing. It's it's a dream spot for every kid that ever wanted to be a firefighter, for every adult that ever wanted to be a firefighter. You know, I mean, the the having Tower Ladder 14 in my firehouse, having the experience and the guys in my firehouse, you know, looking back, like, I probably should have taken more advantage of the, the experience I had and the guys I had, you know, just to learn as much as I can instead of thinking that I was this you know, I'm, I'm the man, I'm this badass West side firefighter now. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you kind of take advantage of those situations, especially in my, you know, state of mind and my mentality now that, um, man, it's just, it was amazing. You know, it was, it's such an amazing spot to be able to do what we do and did. And we, we, the one thing I get asked constantly, I mean, I swear to God, it's almost like a daily thing, especially, you know, meeting new people all the time and stuff. Like I get asked all the time, do you miss being a firefighter? Uh huh. And I miss, I miss it dearly, obviously, but I've had to, you know, be, I've had to make peace in my heart and in my mind that I'm not anymore and I can never be again. But one thing that I truly, truly do miss is the opportunity to help intervene in somebody's life that would end up not, not having a good outcome if we weren't able to be there to intervene with them. Uh, right. You know what I mean? So that's that's what is the worst part is that, you know, I don't get to help people. And and on 117 and on the west side and Inglewood and, any, you know, any fire department anywhere, um, you know, we're in the position that we could actually truly help people every single day that we walk into the firehouse and that we walk down our uniforms. That's what I miss the most. You know what I mean? And I think... I took advantage of that when I had the opportunity to be on 117 and get detailed to truck 29 by you guys and mm-hmm. engine 95 down the street and truck 26. And like, I think that if I had the opportunity to go back, I would try to like kind of go in slow motion and just try to take a step back and, and truly enjoy the opportunity that I had. Um, so that's what I miss the most about actually being a firefighter paramedic is that every day we had the opportunity to change someone's life for the better. Um, and that's, that's what I wish, you know, looking back, I wish I would have taken more advantage of to, you know, not get so enthralled in the, you know, the rock star lifestyle or the rock star mentality being on, you know, 117, you mm-hmm. know, or the, or the, you know, the men here and the women on the job and stuff. And, you know, um, kind of just absorb more of it, you know? So I got, I got caught up in that and I, you know, I thought I was a rock star and I thought I was a badass and definitely lived the lifestyle of that. And, um, you know, the universe, like I said earlier, had a much different plan for me, you know? Okay. Well, let's, let's, um, let's talk about that. Let's, let's get into kind of what, what happened and what went on from there. Sure. So, um, I was injured. Um, I had a distal, uh, bicep tendon tendon rupture. So I tore my right bicep off the bone. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you did that on my daily day because you um, did you do it on? I was on one seventeen. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, we were carrying a seventy one year old lady out of a house. Okay. And, um, yeah. I felt a pop. I felt this throbbing sensation, and it felt like my arm had a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, I didn't really lose grip strength, so I was like, oh, I might not be in too much danger. Like this might be all right. You know, I might be all right. Whatever. And then um, we got out, got the lady in the ambulance, and, uh, you know, I remember taking off my coat. And I looked at my bicep, and my bicep was up in my shoulder. And I was kind of like, oh, man, this not damn, so. this does not look right. Yeah. So I remember asking one of the guys on my rig, uh, I said, hey, uh, come here, take a look at this. I think I messed up my arm. And I remember distinctly, he goes, oh, grow, like, oh, <laughs> shit, you know. 
And um, the, the perfect fireman answer. Yeah, you know, and it's like you know, being on the west side, we see gross stuff every day, we see brutal stuff every yeah. day. So, but not get, to us, not yeah, to like, each don't other. Don't say it to me, man. Like you know, compose yourself a little bit, bro. Yeah. This is me. But um, so then I remember uh, Lori Timothy was the paramedic on the scene, and um, she was on the ambulance, and I remember um, one of the guys yelled to Lori, "Hey, Lori, Spencer." Spencer's hurt. Spencer messes his arm up, you know, and she comes over and she, let me see. And I remember lifting on my t-shirt and she goes, oh my God, what did you do? And I go, oh, come on. I'm like, two people, not two people. Like, come on, we're tougher than this, right? So uh, I remember I telling my lieutenant, I said, hey, Lou, I, you know, I think I messed up. You know, I'm like, I don't, I don't, it, it was weird because I'm sure anybody that's ever, that's having to can relate. But like, you think if you rip your bicep off the bone, like you can't move your arm. Yeah. It was crazy because I, I was able to move my arm. I was able to move my hand, you know, whatever. Um, ended up calling an ambulance. I went, I was transported to uh, Northwestern. I got evaluated and then I got set up with um, a doc from Rush through the department, you know, and um, I had surgery. Uh, there was a time limit on it. So you have to be, uh, you know, you got to have surgery within X amount of days or there could be permanent damage, whatever. So, um, I was in operating room within, within a couple of days and I had my, um, bicep reattached to my forearm. So through that, um, this is kind of where it all started. So, um, with this, there was a complication after this post surgery, right? Post operation. Mm -hmm. Um, there was only one real, um, um, like what's it called? I can't think of the word, but one possible like bad outcome of the surgery okay i can't think of what I'm talking about. um you say a complication or yeah, a, like one bad one major problem. complication could be from this and S it's side effect um well yeah, not side know, effect not i know side effect. It, i know and then once we're once Perfect. we're done recording we're All like right, oh yeah. that was the word Text me at 3 <laughs> you know oh yeah that's it yeah, yeah. But edit that in um but so I knew the risks, right? And, you know, I had to have my arm fixed, whatever. So let's do this. So we did it, whatever. So after a few days, um, I, I couldn't move my hand, which was really weird, right? So I was able to grip, but I wasn't able to open my hand at all. Now, this is your right? My right hand, yeah, of course. And you're right-handed? Of course, I'm right-handed. Okay. So, yes, this is my right hand. Uh, right just arm just making sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because that just throws a whole different dynamic into the mix of trying to learn everything, you know, left-handed. And, um, you know, through all this, I, I live alone. I got a, a dog, uh, single, you know, so it's like not like I could just be like, hey. Uh oh you hear that? Hey, hunt. Well, single. <laughs> I didn't mean to throw Ready that in to there. Ready to mangle him? No. I didn't mean to throw that in there, but, you know. Why I'm not? not? I'm not saying. I'm just saying. Um, but like, you know, it's, and they it's just listening. not like, right. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's not like I could say like, Hey, you know, Hey, babe, can you do this for me right, or whatever? Like, you. no, it's just on my own, you know? So, yeah. um, yeah. So that's the one, one of the major side effects or the, one of the, uh, major, um, complications from that surgery was radial, your, your radial nerve damage, right? So your radial nerve runs on the outside, right? Where one of the incisions is made, you know, and that. So, so I knew the risks, whatever. And, um, I couldn't. Now it's like three days post operation. I still can't move my my hand, mm -hmm. so I could grip things. And I'm in a cast, so it's not like I'm not I'm not like really using my hand that much anyway. But you know, you start thinking about things. You start like googling side effects and mm -hmm. this and that. It's like oh, right, radial nerve, radial nerve damage, this and that, blah blah, whatever. And I'm like, come on. I'm like, what are the chances? How bad right? can this be? Yeah. Right, like now nah, well, that won't happen to me. <laughs> And, you know, I said that quite a few times over the years, you know, no, it ain't going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it goes about that. Um, ultimately, my right radial nerve was damaged. So we didn't know if it was like a bifurcation or severed or just strangled from like the spreaders, you know, whatever this and that. But now my, I can't move my right hand. Mm -hmm. So now I'm thinking I'm terrified because now is my career over? is, you know, am I ever going to be able to move my hand again? You know, this and that. So, of course, the department's like, excuse me, they're like, well, we'll send you, you know, to a specialist. We'll send you to this. We'll send you that, you know. And uh, everything just takes so long. You know, everything's, you know, all the specialist is only there on, you know, the third Tuesday of every odd month, you know, right. between this Especially hour. when it's you because it feels like – 
I want to get this done. Like yeah, us, like, it's yeah. like the, that personality. Well, yeah. I want to get fixed immediately. Yeah, like, let's what's go. The, yeah, what, what's what the fastest I yeah, can do? Right. This is your job. I know right. my job. Right. This is your job yeah, to yeah. fix me. So we don't get to like take days <laughs> off and you know, like oh, we we're only going to respond to fires on this day on this time. Right. Like, no, like, I understand. So, so then the specialist, you know, like I meet with him and um, he he wanted to do so. So like I was getting so many different like people saying, no, 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 just just leave it be. It, it'll regenerate even if it's strangled, as long as it's not bifurcated or, you know, severed, split in half. Like it'll regenerate. It takes forever for nerves to regenerate, you know, blah, blah, whatever. And it's like, well, I don't got time. Like, you know, we only have a certain amount of time before we get back to work before, you know, it's like something has to happen. Like there's a decision that has to be made. So, um, this one, uh, this one surgeon wanted to, uh, do a nerve graft where they take a cadaver nerve, which is a nerve out of a dead body and graft it into your nerve. Mm -hmm. So at this time, you know, this was a long time, well, not a long time ago, but years ago, this was a fair, fairly new procedure, right? Uh Not every day. Not every doctor in the country can do nerve grafts, right? Because nerves are so fragile anyway. You know, it's not like a skin graft, which is pretty common these days, you know. So I'm already kind of terrified of like, well, do I want a new, a cadaver? That's a dead body. Yeah. A nerve out of a dead body in me, you know, and that kind of plays a part into you know, the future of the story too. Okay. But I was kind of like, nah, just let my body, let's see if it'll heal, you know, this and that, whatever, you know, you get, you get fed so many different opinions and so many different ideas and advice from the fire department. You know, everybody's an expert in everything, you know, yeah, oh my God. at the firehouse. They, we got a table here, but if it was in the kitchen, then we yes. could literally solve Every problem all in of the world. world. <laughs> every one of them. Every one of them. At the firehouse kitchen table with a cup of coffee will solve all the problems. So, right. you know, I'm getting fed all these advice and all this and this, do this, do this, that. No, I'll do this. No, this is going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. You're going to do this. And it's kind of like, well, that's awesome to hear, but it's also like, this is my body. This is my right hand that I can't move. Right. You know what I mean? Like, it was so crazy to wake up every day and not be able to move move my right hand. I know. You know what just I mean? Just like, like can look at it and it's yeah, just not yeah, I mean, doing just, what you tell it to do. It was crazy because like, you know, you're telling your brain we're, so we're, you know, you could say any firefighter, paramedic, any first responder are pro athletes, right? We're paid to use our bodies, right? So it's like, all day long, you're telling your body, do this, do that, lift this, do that, grab this, grab that. You know what I mean? So right. it's like when your brain is telling your body, like, open your hand to grab that cup and it's not opening. It's like the, it's such a trip, like a mind trip to be like, wow, what is actually happening right now? How did this happen? How did I end up like this? And this, you know, in the grand scheme of it, it was such a minuscule problem, but still, it was like, it's my right hand. I can't move it and I have a time limit, you know, before something happens, right? So we ended up not doing the nerve graft and I kind of just ended up going idle for a little bit with that. So, um, you know, it, it's crazy being off duty and, um, you know, time goes so quickly, but it also goes so slow, slow at the same, at the same time. time. Yeah, It's crazy, you know, so I'm off, I'm off the job on layup and, um, uh, you know, t- time goes, time goes, time goes. Right. So now I start to feel sick. You want to get into this now? Into yeah. This part? Yeah. 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 I, I mean, that's pretty much it with, with, I mean, with, right, the, with the arm. Yeah. my arm was, I mean, we could just recap that real quick, but my, my arm was, my right hand was paralyzed for about four and a half years. Oh, wow. I didn't so, know it was, yeah, okay. yeah, it was wild. I had that crazy uh, claw on that. I, I do remember. That, yeah, yep. it was called a dynamic splint, right? And it yep. would look like a Wolverine claw. So that was, I wore that so I could actually utilize my hand. So I had that for like four and a half years. But thank God, knock on wood, uh, you know, my nerve regenerated, came back, and I actually have full use of my hand now, which is awesome, right? Mm-hmm. So, but while all this was going on, um, I, I, I started to feel sick, right? And it was like in October, well, maybe September, because I remember for my birthday, my birthday is in October, early October, and I remember I didn't go out for my birthday because I, I started to feel sick, right? Mm-hmm. I started to feel ill. And I just didn't know what was wrong with me. It kind of felt like a cold was coming on that just never got better, but always kind of continually got worse. But 
I didn't know really how it got worse. But then, like, as the days go by, now, again, I'm off duty, so I'm not, I don't have to worry about going to the firehouse with a cold, you know, this and that. I'm, right. a, I'm a paramedic. I'm, you know, I'm a real big, tough guy. I know how to take care of myself. I, you know, just got a cold. It's no big deal. So you'll shoot, you know, day cool every day, take vitamins, whatever, take mm-hmm. your, you know, NyQuil to go to bed, and I'm fine, right? Nothing, nothing's severely going to be wrong with me because I'm this young, tough guy, right? Right. So I just continue to feel worse and worse and worse. So I felt worse, like, to the point where I even want to go out for my birthday, felt worse and worse and worse, and days just turned, it, it literally just turned into, like, one day. The week turned into the month and, you know, whatever. And um, so then uh, come December of this year, um, I got a text message from my brother-in-law and it said, he said that, um, he goes, your mom's sick. Um, you should come to the hospital. So I'm sorry. No, it's all good. <laughs> it's it's all, all good. My mom was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. Mm-hmm. So she was deemed terminal right away. She had a huge mass in her right lung. Um, the cancer metastasized to her brain, her ovaries, her right hip, like within days, right? Mm-hmm. So now, my mom's just the just the toughest, most badass woman you could ever meet. She's a hundred percent Italian. She just worked every day of her life. She did and just got everything she could and did everything she could for my sister and I. And she never complained. She just worked. She did her thing. She raised us the best that she could, and she just took life like took the took life with the blows, like just, and went, just rolled. went at it. She was yep. such an amazing human being. Mm-hmm. So, um, I, I wanted to be there for my mom every day. So now it turned into my mom's fight against cancer. She would, the one physician there, uh, told me that they, they estimated she probably had about three months to live. So seeing my mom every day, like I knew that wasn't, there's no way. Like she, every day I saw her deteriorate and every day, like it was just worse and worse and worse. And the aggression of the cancer, um, just seeing that, like I knew there's no way she's got three months, you know, Mm -hmm. this is my own personal, obviously I didn't say that to anybody or, you know, tell my family or whatever, but, um, Mm -hmm. I like now everything with me is out the back door. Like I'm not even care about how I feel like that I got to be there with my mom every day. Yeah. Um, so every day turned into, I, f- I was feeling worse and worse, but I, I was going out to Alexian brothers. She was in Alexian brothers in Elk Grove village, uh, which is fairly close to the city, right. uh, right outside O'Hare. So it wasn't a horrible drive. It wasn't like I was driving hours a day, but you know, uh, it was a commute to get there, be with my mom as much as I could, as long as I could. And then, you know, go home and then, you know, go back the next day, be with my mom the next day. Every day I continue to feel like worse and worse and worse. Mm-hmm. Now I wasn't working out. I was ordering food out. Like I'd order, you know, double meals. So I had lunch, I had dinner, you know, I had food when I came back. So I wasn't mm-hmm. really eating well. I definitely wasn't exercising because I felt so, so crappy. Mm-hmm. So I could tell I started gaining weight. Um, but I didn't know like to the extent, right? So, Every day I would feel worse, it would start, like, there would be, like, a new ailment, I guess. Like, not every day, but uh, but maybe, like, once a week, right? And it got to the point where I was, my mom was going through chemo. My mom went through radiation. She fought, like, tooth and nail, like, the hardcore, tough Italian single mom Woman did, was, you know. Yeah. And, um, and I couldn't tell, like, I wanted to get to her hospital bed. I wanted to tell her, oh, my God, mom, I feel so sick, you know. But I couldn't tell her because I know she would just throw everything out the window herself and be like, you know, call a doctor. Yeah. Call a doctor in. She'd be like, pull another hospital bed in here. Put my son in here. And that's not what you want. No, absolutely not. I don't need her to worry about about me. It's It's about about her. her. Yeah. She's fighting for her life here, you know? And all she ever said was, uh, cause I'd be like, what is happening? Like, what's going on? Why did this happen? All my, all my mom would ever say is it is what it is, Michael. It is what it is. And I'm like, you just, you know, like when is the point where like you, you're allowed to say F this, like F this world, F this life. Like she had such a hard life and still like to her last day, she was like, it is what it is. You know, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. This what happens and we're going to, we're going to go with this now, you know? So seeing my mom's fight, you know, through cancer and literally, you know, her fight for her life, you know, was so impactful for me into what, you know, what I went into, um, it was incredible. Like even, you know, like my mom's last lessons for me, you know, still I think about every day. Um, and, uh, 
So I started to feel really, really sick. Like my mom's last few days, like to the point where getting up and walking to the bathroom was like nauseating. It was like a chore within itself. It was insane. It was like I would be out of breath. I would just feel horrible. Going from the parking lot to my mom's hospital room, I would stop in the bathroom and I would puke because I was so exhausted, right? Uh And then um, like her last week, I started coughing up blood. And I was like, "Shit, this isn't part of my French." Uh, I'm like, "This isn't good," you know. We, we got to we got to eat. It's little, okay. Yeah. So whatever whatever <laughs> you want to say. I'm trying. I'm trying my best not We're to. Here but, for you. So it was like, um, you know, now I'm coughing up blood. So I mean, like being a paramedic, it's like you know, it's it's scary enough to know, like you know enough to really scare yourself, but you also know enough to be like, no, this that can't be yeah. happening, or yeah. this can't be happening. Like, it's just got to be a cold, right? So in my in my mind, I had a cold that turned into the flu, that turned into upper respiratory infection, that turned into lower respiratory infection, that now turned into pneumonia, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, yeah, that makes sense, right? That in my own mind. That's what's going on. And you know what? No, you know, at the time I was 33, no 33 year old dies from pneumonia. No 33 year old dies from the flu. I'm a big tough guy, right? Like this is, I'm, I'm going to get through this. It's all good. Whatever. Still got to be there for my mom. Not going to let my mom know anything. Like I would cough into a tissue in my, next to my mom's hospital bed and it would be full of blood and I would throw it away and pray that my mom didn't see that. Cause mm-hmm. she'd be like, she would lose her mind. I know she would lose her mind if she knew how sick I was, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but my mom, uh, you know, ultimately my mom was diagnosed on December 16th, 2013, and she ended up passing away January 15th, 2014. So it wasn't even a month. My mom, it, I mean, cancer just av- absolutely ravaged her. And um, my mom passed away. She took her final breaths. I was sitting right there holding her hand when she passed away. And, um, you know, seeing her strength through all of it. Sorry, man. No, this is all good. That's It really, like, you know, obviously it affected me. But it was also like, damn, man, my mom didn't complain about anything. She literally... I heard her last heartbeat on the heart monitor and she still never complained. She never complained. She just took the blows and went, you know, and I'd think to myself like on the job, right? We see so many people in, um, in different times in their life and like people like that you think to yourself that, you know, it's like, you know, is this really a big deal? Is this really a big deal? And people mm-hmm. have different emotional, you know, um, reactions, reactions and, to yep. it. And like my mom's emotional reaction was just like, it is what it is. You know, this is it. I'm going to go rest now, you yeah. know? And, um, so my mom ended up passing away and, um, you know, now it was just, now we just got to make sure my mom's at rest, take care of the services. And then I said to myself, all right, I'm going to go, I'll go get checked out. Um, but at this point now, like, to be honest, and you know, I know it's not a tough guy. Like I keep saying, I'm such it's, a tough guy, but I started to get scared because uh-huh. I'm like this. The, that is very. That's more than understandable. Yeah, man. I mean, it. You know, no one wants to admit it, especially you know, uh, anybody that's in a profession like us. Like, you know, we're called to be there for people in their most terrifying times, and we're the ones that have to take it and and you know pretend like we're not scared, right? But at this point, I was I was a little scared, and um. So we had my mom's funeral and I remember putting my suit on and it was just tight. Like it, nothing, I barely fit. Right. Mm-hmm. And I was like, damn, I've been, I've been putting on a lot of weight. Like mm-hmm. I need to, I need to get, get right with this, you know, do like, something. Yeah. but I was just so exhausted. I just, obviously I'm not going to start. Then you still got the hand. It's not. Yeah. My hand's paralyzed. Yeah, it's it's half paralyzed. Yeah. Okay. That's still like, at that point I was like, I'm just, you know, whatever, who cares at this point, yes. you know, like it's still attached. So maybe one day it'll work again, but you know, there's so many other things going on right now. It's yeah. Like, I, yeah. I that's even, a lot. What do I even need a right hand for at this point? Like, you know, but so, um, you know, we had my mom's funeral. It was a great funeral. Um, and, I, I remember texting one of my buddies. He's actually on the job now. Um, I texted him. He was he was such a good friend through all this. Uh, he knew I wasn't feeling right. He knew I wasn't sick or I wasn't just sick. Right. And he constantly would say, you know, do you want me to bring food over? Do you need anything? Like, let me take you to the hospital. You got to get checked out. You know, like this and that. Of course, like, nah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, 
so a- after my mom's funeral, I get home and I remember texting him and I'm like, bro, like, I think it's time. Like I, I gotta go to the hospital, man. Like everything's done. My mom's at rest now. Funeral's over. Like I gotta go to the hospital. So he says to me, he goes, Oh fuck. He's like tonight. <laughs> I, go, he, tonight? I, I go, yeah, man. Why? He goes, he goes, Oh, he goes, you know, well, remember the girl that you hooked me up with and i was like yeah what's up man he's like well i, th- I just told her i was gonna take her out to the movies tonight was he's the like, night yeah yeah he goes i want to take her out to the movies i'm ready to go pick her up i'm like and then of course me like like oh just it, wait dude. i was like oh no like hell yeah no, i'm so happy you guys are going out like yeah yeah man you know what i've had a long day like go do your thing you know hit me up in the morning look at that so he he would That's drive a, by you're a hell of a guy yeah That's something a... like i uh i would drive by and even like this story of, like hooking him up with this it was, it was hilarious like he just it was just so funny i was just so happy that they were going out together and i didn't have to be there too because yeah. that's kind of like how it started he yeah. was like oh you know hey oh let's set up like hook me up with this girl so set up this so like i like asked her friend out to like go out with us so we had a double date yeah, like so you yeah, know what i mean yeah. like, he was almost like and hold this guy's hand yeah. and like get this girl's number and tell him <laughs> to do this now so now i was kind of like hell yeah man go like have fun he was like marty mcfly coaching his dad yeah was hilarious <laughs> exactly you know like so I was just so pumped. I was like, dude, you know what? Just go have fun. Have a great night tonight. He would drive by my place going to work. Um, so I'm like, you know, in the morning, I'm like, you mind just coming by, swinging by, picking me up and drop me off at Masonic? And he's like, yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll text you at, you know, 515 or whatever, you know, and, and I'll drop you off. Then I'm like, cool. I'm like, you know what? It's, it's better. Like, let's, I'm just gonna not think about anything tonight i'm gonna just you know have one night and then tomorrow morning it's it it's game time tomorrow morning i'm gonna figure out what's wrong with me we're gonna hit this run at 5 a.m let's do this okay so go to bed whatever I wake up the next morning he comes and picks me up and you know he's like you know i'm so glad that you finally are going to get checked out you know so i go yeah I go, you know it's, I, it'll be all right like whatever so i get to the hospital i walk up into the emergency room and it was actually a, a dude on the job was the uh, uh, triage nurse and i remember telling him i'm like i just don't feel good i go i feel horrible i go in about the past week i've been coughing up blood i go I, I don't think i've been exposed to tb in any sense or whatever mm-hmm. this and that i go i don't do anything at my home whatever i got a, a paralyzed right hand mm-hmm. um i'm not i haven't been you know running calls or whatever for a while so it's like uh but whatever do whatever you gotta do so he's like all right you know they triage me. They put me in the isolation room, uh, of course, for per PD or uh, TB precautions and stuff. And um, they come in and do a chest X-ray. Mm-hmm. So my chest X-ray comes back, and I told them, I'm like, you know, I think I just got a, the, a cold that turned into the flu. That you turned gave from the whole yeah, yeah, paramedic like, breakdown. Yeah, yeah, you know, upper like, respiratory, this is, lower this, respiratory. Yeah, this is what I think. Like, let's just isolate it. Let's take care of it. I got to get yeah. on some IV antibiotics. Let's do this. Like, yeah. let's hit it. You know. Um, and so they come and do the chest x-ray. And then I remember the doctor from uh, when I was on the ambulance in that neighborhood. Um, you know, I would go in there. And there was, I, I liked Masonic because there, you know, there's so many people on the job that work, yeah, work at, in the hospital and the ER there. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've known a few of the doctors for years. They're friends of my family and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I just felt comfortable going to Masonic. Little did I know, like, what all was going on and what I needed or whatever. But um, so... Chest x-ray comes back. My right lung is filled with fluid. It's about three quarters or like 77% filled with fluid. So wow. the doc comes in and she puts my x-ray up and she's like, this is the the largest pneumonia I've seen this season, right? Mm-hmm. So, because now we're in a January. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was like January, my mom's funeral was like January 21st. So this is January 22nd, 2014, right? Mm-hmm. So um, she's like, this is a massive pneumonia. Like, look at your lung. So she's like, how did you even walk in here? She, or she goes, how'd you get here? I go, oh, one of my buddies dropped me off and, you know, I just walked in. She goes, I don't even know how you walked in with this much fluid in your lung, you know, this and that. I'm like, well, you know, I, it's, I go, when I move, it sucks. I go, but when I just rest, when I sit here or when I'm laying, you know, you're laying on the examining bed or whatever, um, I go, I feel fine. Like right. I feel cool now. Yeah. But when I got to get up and I got to move, it's like, oh my God, it's exhausting. I got to sit down right away. Mm-hmm. She's like, well, tell me what what else is going on. You know, I go, you know, I go, the exhaustion's crazy. I go, if I if I walk for too long, like walking my dog was horrendous. Like mm-hmm. I, I would get back in and I would have to throw up, you know, and and it wasn't like anything. It was just like just almost the act of like throwing up, not actually throwing anything up. But yeah, um, yeah. I was exhausted, right? So 
I was like, you know, I put, a, I had a suit on yesterday. I was, I've gained a ton of weight. I go, my legs were like killing me by the end of the day. Like I had to get home and just put my legs up, you know, this and that. I go, I kind of like have trouble breathing when I sit in a funny way, you know, this and that. So she looks at my legs and she goes, oh my gosh, she's feeling my ankles. I'm feeling my calves. She goes, how long have your legs been swollen like this? Mm -hmm. I go, I have no idea. I go, I, I live life like a 80 year old Italian guy. I'm in a sweatsuit every day, you know, yeah. I'm in a jumpsuit. I go, I don't yeah. have to put my uniform on I don't really have to wear jeans I don't have to do anything I don't like, have to right I, go, I don't know I go I, I haven't been working out for months now because I feel sick and like you know so I'm gaining weight I'm ordering pizza every day you know like I go I, I, I don't know so she's like um we're gonna do uh uh EKG on you. I go, all right, whatever. Like, do whatever you want. Yeah. You know, we had, she's like, this is a, the biggest pneumonia I've seen. So I'm like, we, all right, we know it's a pneumonia, whatever. Yeah. So she's like, we're going to start an IV on you. We're going to get you on IV antibiotics, you know, whatever. I go, all right, cool. So then this happens. So then she says, well, let's do a, a EKG on you. All right, cool. We'll do whatever you want. So they come in, do an EKG. Then they come in and they do a 12 lead EKG. Mm -hmm. So then they leave and she comes back in and she's like, um, when's the last time you had an echocardiogram? And I go, ma'am, I go, I, I don't, I don't even know what echocardiogram is. Right. Like I, I, at the time I had no idea. I know being a paramedic probably should, but yeah. and having so many patients, that's like, we, oh, I just, we not doing them. So we well, don't right, know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. You know, people like, you know, your patient, you got an 89 year old patient yeah, with chest no, pain. We, One, we take them there. And, I had, yeah. I had my echo last month. Like, oh, cool. Oh, all right. Yeah. Oh, right. I, what an echo is. I'll like, write that down. Yeah. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I'll note that, you know, yeah. but so. I go, I've, I've never had one. I'm 33. I've never had an echocardiogram before, you know? So she goes, well, we're going to do one. I go, all right, do whatever you want, you know? So while we're waiting for that, she's like talking about um, the IV, the antibiotics. She's like, well, while we're waiting, we put the orders in for this. We're going to start you on IV antibiotics, you know, just in case, you know? I go, how, I go, oh, cool. I go, um, I go, hey, how long do you think I'm going to be here? Like, do you think I'm going to get out of here soon? Uh, I go, I got a dog at home. I, I got to walk my dog. Yeah, I go, I got a dog at home. Like, <laughs> yeah. I got to get him. I left pretty early, 5 a.m. this morning, you know? Now it's like maybe 8, 9 in the morning. And uh, she's like, um, you're not leaving for a couple of days. And I go, whoa, 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 what do you mean a couple of days? She goes, yeah. did you see your lung like that? We need to clear that out. We need to get you on, on, on antibiotics, this and that. I go, can I just get them to go? Like, can I get, there has to be like pill form uh, antibiotics I could have, right? And she's right. like, you're out of your mind. She's like, no. She goes, call your little, call one of your little firefighter friends. Tell them to get your dog, you know, whatever. So I go, all right. So then the echo comes in. So all like... You know, just I find out all an echocardiogram is is an ultrasound, right? So this ultrasound tech comes in, does the echocardiogram. You know, I was like, oh, cool. I didn't have to get poked or prodded or, you know, more IV pinches or whatever. Like, that was easy. I'll do echoes every day for right. all I care. <laughs> so then she comes back in and she, um, she says, well, we're going to do a chest CT. So I go, all right. I go, well, wh like why we've done so many tests already. Like, why do we got to do a chest CT? I mean, I said yes to it, like whatever she wants, but I said, um, you know, why do we got to do the chest CT? And she goes, you know what? It's just like the last piece of the puzzle that we need right now. So we're just going to do the chest CT and I'll tell you everything that's going on when it's done. I go, all right, cool. So I go get the chest CT, come back in. And now she comes in to my hospital room with a couple other doctors, right? Okay. So now we got like so now they're teaming up on you. Five doctors in the room now, right? Okay. So it's her and it's a few other doctors. So she starts introducing them, and she says cardiologist, 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 and their names, right? So I was like, well, why is this team of cardiologists in my ER room now, right? She goes, well, let me explain to you what we found, right? She's like, so we we knew your lung was filled with fluid. She goes, so, but we don't think it's a pneumonia, right? She goes, so, uh, so we did a EKG. She goes, I, we saw some abnormalities on the EKG. And I was like, well, tell me like what you saw. Like, is it a different rhythm? Am I in a block? Am I in a sinus? You know, like what, just kind of like explain. She goes, it's just going medic on them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like I want to, <laughs> yeah. I want to know, I don't want to be, don't beat around the bush. Don't sugarcoat anything. Like tell me straight up what is happening. Right. Right. So, um, she was like, you know what? She goes, nothing significant. Like, it wasn't like I was throwing PVCs or I was in, like, a third-degree block or anything like that. But, like, she's like, it just didn't look good. Like, your your rhythm just didn't look right. She goes, that's why we did the echo. She goes, and seeing your echo, she goes, we saw that your 
heart function or your EF, your ejection fraction, she said was, we saw that it was extremely low. So she says that that's why we did the CT scan because we needed to see what like your heart looked like and what was going on in your chest. Like what's causing your heart to be this low, right? Mm -hmm. So my EF or my ejection fraction was 11%. So to me, I was kind of like, well, what does 11% mean? Like, I don't know if that's good. Is that bad? Like, what, what is the EF of 11? And she said, uh, one of the cardiologists said, like, you know, an EF of, like, 17 people just die, uh-huh. right? Like, you just, you, you're not supposed to be alive with an EF of 11, right? And, like, even to this day when I tell stories, tell this story to people that are, you know, cardiac nurses or, you know, other cardiologists or this and that, they, when I say I had an EF of 11, they're like, no, you didn't. Like, like right, that's, like, yeah. that's not right. Like, it gave you, know, you the wrong number. Like, well, yeah, yeah, like that you shouldn't be talking right now, right? Right. So the, um, then she said that on uh, within the seat, so the EF's 11, um, you know, my right lung's filled with fluid. My EF is 11. My heart just looks horrible. She said the, the pumping function of my heart looked horrible. Um, and the CT showed I had one blood clot in the right atrium of my heart. Uh, it was like lodged on the wall, right, on the inside of my heart. Then she said they found about 10 or so uh, blood clots across my lungs. So I had one blood clot inside the right, right atrium of my heart. I had 10 blood clots. Ten, they said like 10 to 12 blood clots throughout my lungs. Um, my EF was 11, you know, and she said my heart from the CT scan, it looked like it was about two times the size of what my heart from my chest cavity should be, mm. right? So my heart's swollen and it's it's functioning incredibly poorly and I got blood clots all over. Right. Mm-hmm. So what she said, well, I mean, ultimately I said, what are you telling me? Are you telling me I'm in like CHF or something? And she's like, yeah, that's exactly what we're telling you. We were telling you in heart, you're an acute dilated. Well, at first they, they didn't know if it, what caused it or what was causing it. So they, they didn't want to say anything. Right. Like, cause God forbid, you don't say anything about anything. Doctors don't want to say anything. Cause you know, everybody's going to sue everybody these days, whatever. So I didn't really right. get like an actual diagnosis till I was at Christ. Mm -hmm. Uh, later like a couple days later um so she said well all we know right now is that your heart is failing right you're you're in acute heart failure uh your aef's 11 and she pretty much said so the the team that was there that i met was the cath lab team right Uh so that's the team of doctors that do emergency you know heart transplant do emergency chest or you know crack your chest and do that stuff you know and that so i'm like that's kind of insane that the you know the the team of doctors that you know are there to save your life for your heart are sitting there making eye contact with me right now right right? Right. so she pretty much said like my case for them is just is way too i'm I'm out of their league in a sense um so she's like we're we've already made phone calls to liola and to christ their heart centers she said whichever hospital has an icu bed open up first you're going to so I was like, wait a second. I go, I went from, you know, going maybe two days here on a gen med floor for infection for, you know, like a pneumonia, pneumonia to yeah. ICU. I go, how long am I going to be in the ICU for? Yeah. And she was literally like, uh, I can't, t- I, I'm not even yeah. touching that. Is that like, our league? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not answering know. any questions at this point. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they started to plead the fifth real quick. Right. <laughs> so she's like, we do, we have a cardiac room open. So we're going to transfer you to the cardiac floor. And then when an ambulance comes, you know, we're going to, we're going to send you by ambulance to cry or whoever comes first. Right. Mm-hmm. So before I went to the, to the floor. So now I'm like, I'm like scrambling. Cause now I'm like, Oh crap. What about my dog? Man? Yeah. Like Capone's sitting at home. He's clueless on this. Yeah. He doesn't know what is What's happening going right on? now. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, man, I gotta, I gotta find someone to watch my dog. I'm, I'm texting, you know, all kinds of people to come get my dog, come watch my dog. He's an 85 pound pit bull. Like, who wants that kind of responsibility? <laughs> if he was like a little lab dog, it'd be different. Like, just put him in your pocket and walk around. This guy, yeah. he loves being on top. He thinks he's a lab dog. He, he's, he's a real pounds. dog. Yeah, I've, he I've seen him. I've eats, seen pictures of him. Yeah, so. he eats a ton of food. Like, that's a big responsibility. I don't want somebody now, you know, for an unknown amount of time. Like, how yeah. long am I in the hospital for? Yeah. So. Got a hold of a couple of my buddies and, you know, like, luckily I was able to find some people to take care of him and watch him while I was in the hospital. So he's was as spoiled as ever, you know. Um, but so I, I got transferred up to a cardiac floor and then a bed at Christ opened up. So then they uh, told me that they called a 
a, uh, ambulance to transport me, private ambulance to transport me over. And I actually knew the medic on the ambulance. <laughs> it, was just, it was funny. That's, like, that's, it, that's awesome. It was too. kind of funny. Like, uh, you know, the paramedics came. Well, it was a, it was an EMT driving. I believe she was an EMT. And then a paramedic and nurse in the back and then a paramedic. Like, it was a, a critical care nurse. Yep. And then, because we had all these, you know, machines, monitors, and stuff. And yeah. stuff. So yeah. uh, the paramedic though was on the job or is on the job, mm-hmm. and he's like, he's like, man, I, rem- I read Mike Spencer, and I'm like, no, nah, that can't be the same the guy, guy from 117. Yeah. He's like, and I walk in, and it, it is. is. I'm like, ah, what's up, bro? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't this wild, you know? <laughs> and like, they they were awesome though. Like, uh, it was weird though. I'll be honest. Uh, the nurse on the rig was like, uh, you know, Mike, I want to do something. Um, you know, and I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to freak you out or anything. And, you know, by this point I'm like, bro, like just it's past that point, you ain't going to freak me <laughs> out, man. Like you, I'm already d- deep into this dude. Yeah. Like what can you possibly do to me? That's going to freak me out. So he's like, well, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's small on the back of an ambulance. You know how it is. And I want to do this. Uh, so like, I think it's the best interest for you in case something happens and this and that. And I'm finally like, bro, just stop talking. What do you want to do to me? And he goes, uh, I want to put the uh, defib pads on you. I was like, that's a great idea. Yeah, like, exactly. throw those pads. I'll put them on myself, guy. Like, are you kidding me? Like, yes, let's save time in case I die. You got these pads. Right, just like, push the button. I'm like, then I'm kind of like, why didn't you guys put the pads on me? Like, you're all worried about my heart. No one put these pads on. Like, get them on right now. I'm taking my shirt off. Like, hell yeah. So I get transferred over to Christ. And by this time, you know, it's like, Six o'clock PM, um, you know, Chicago time in January, it starts snowing in the ambulance. It's like, it takes us forever to get there. Right. So we're at Masonic on the North side, uh, you know, off of Belmont ish and we're going to 95th and Pulaski, right. For Christ. So this is like, this is going to be an adventure in a drive. It's snowing in January in rush hour traffic. Right. I'm like, man, I might not make it to yeah. Christ. You know what I mean? Like this, this might be a wild, a wild ride, but we get there and, uh, you know, I get, uh, I, I get put into the ICU and, um, you know, the whole team of nurses meets me and stuff. And, and one, one kind of like impactful thing that happened at that point, um, when they were moving me over, you know, the ambulance, you know, put me next to the bed and, and, uh, and I'm like, I'm like, I'll move, I'll move myself over. Like I knew I was big. Right. Mm. I knew I was overweight at that time. And I'm like, Oh no, I'll move over. And I remember all the nurses like, no, 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 don't move. Don't move. Like don't exert. Like, you know, everybody was afraid of me just dropping dead. Right. Yeah. Um, I was like, no, I'll do it. Like, I'm, I'm big. You know, I don't want, I don't want any ladies to throw your back out on my big ass. Yeah. So they, they refused. They were adamant about it. So I just, I gave in and let them, you know, lift me over. And I remember they're, you know, they're, I'm getting vitals taken and they're checking IVs and they're doing this and they're doing that. And it was like, they were such an amazing team there. Um, but I remember one of the nurses saying, um, you know, age, uh, this, that height, you know, whatever, and weight. And I remember this one lady, she wrote, one of the nurses wrote it down on a sheet of paper and she just handed it over to the other lady. And I was kind of like, no, this is no secrets. Like, yeah. what, tell, what do I weigh? Yeah. You know, I'm like, what, why are you hiding that? Everyone's yelling, oh, he's 5'10", oh, he's 33, oh, yeah. this and that. All of a sudden the weight comes up and everyone's like, oh, shoot. Put that on a piece of paper. Right. We don't say that out loud. I was like, well, what do I weigh? And I remember one of the nurses turns and looks at me. She goes, 280. I said, I'm 280 what? pounds. And she's like, yeah. I go, all right. So I go to my side, I think to myself, all right, like this is where it starts right now. 280 pounds. I'm like, I'm not that tall. You know, like I should be 180. You know what I mean? Like yeah, 280. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. oh my God. So that's kind of like where this mentality now starts, right? I'm like, oh my God. Like, forget all about like the blood clots in your heart and the heart function, this and that. Like I was almost embarrassed to be that big at, at this wow. age. Yeah. Like I'm almost 300 pounds, man. Right. So I'm like, Oh man. So I started the conversation in my head. Like <laughs> if I get out of here, if I make it out of here alive, I'm losing a hundred pounds. Like that's right that's off the bat. Off this the is bat. it. This yeah. is it. Like, all right. So now it's in my head. Like let's get all this other stuff going. Right. So that, that was so impactful because like, I just wasn't expecting to hear that. And I, you know, all this other stuff that's happening and everything else is like that stuck out of my head. Like, Oh my God, like, damn, man. Like, that's, that's real number. That's huge. Yeah. Dude. Like 280, yeah. like that's too much, yeah. you know? So, so then like they're, they're telling me, you know, um, 
I, everybody's gone for the day pretty much. Like all the cardiologists are off, you know, like I'm going to be tied into everything here. They're already going to start my medications and all this stuff. And, you know, my nurse is like, she's like, you're not going to meet everybody till tomorrow morning. She goes, but I'm going to tell you this tomorrow morning, it's going to be a whirlwind. Like yeah. tomorrow morning, you're going to have teams of doctors coming in, waves of cardiologists coming in and talk to you to try to understand the situation, like to, to, to hear the case. She goes, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of students that are just going to want to see you, want to talk to you. <laughs> You know, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, wait a second, like I'm not on display here. You're a like, case study I'm now. Not a piece of meat. Like I'm a save me first, but then we could talk later, yeah, you know. Yeah. But then it was next day it was I met my cardiologist who I love to this day. He's amazing. And uh, you know, I truly I I, I honestly want to say like the nurses there and my cardiologist, like I swear they saved my life. Right. Like they the nurses are incredible. And, uh, you know, they, my cardiologist, uh, just to jump forward real quick, like when I was being discharged, he's like, all right, I'll set you up with a, a cardiologist that I trust on the North side, mm -hmm. you know, this and that I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I go, no, you're not. <laughs> And he goes, well, what do you mean? I go, well, you're, I'm, you're, I'm never leaving you. Yeah. Like you're stuck with me for. He's only a few years older than me too. So yeah. I'm like, you ain't retiring soon. You're my case for, or I'm your case forever, yeah. guy. Like have car wheel travel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'll drive the 95th Street. Yeah. Okay, ain't that far, you yeah, know. Exactly. So, um, but yeah, like I met him that day. I met the whole team of cardiologists that day. I met you know different nurses and stuff, and it was like full blown. Like let's go. And I told them. Uh, you know, do whatever you got to do to save my life. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't care what has to be done. Just do it. And, you know, let's get going. Like, I want to feel better. I want to get through this. Like, tr let's see what, you know, we can do and, and go from it. Right. So it was at that point, all questions were done because I said, just do whatever you got to do to save my life. Right. Mm -hmm. So I remember I had, you know, two IVs in me. They did a, a swan's catheter, which is a, it's like a catheter surgically implanted into the, your clavicular vein. Mm -hmm. And it was like a main line to my heart. Right. Mm -hmm. So they, they, that's where they gave most of my medication in there. And like they, you got to do like a heparin flush first so you feel this burning burn, sensation. Yeah. oh it's crazy man. Yeah. but it goes right into your heart mm -hmm. there was wires that went into my heart to like read my uh you know my ejection fraction my output all the strength all the stuff like it, it was just crazy so like to me i'm kind of thinking like you know all right we'll do i i did say do whatever you gotta do to save my life so mm -hmm. they're going full charge so this is what the swan's catheter is you know this is whatever so then now i mean like time flew by but it also felt like it was like minutes were hours. You yeah. Know what I mean? Um, so like day two, I remember them saying, well, you're going to have an LVAD implanted. And I was like, uh, whatever. I don't know. Well, this is like a swan's catheter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Throw an LVAD in there. I got IVs in me. Like whatever. Let's just do all the alphabets, you know, like we'll do all the letters. <laughs> so I had no idea what an LVAD was. Right. And, um, so I had the device. So they're, they're, they're telling me they're prepping me for surgery. Right. So they told me that I'm going to do angiogram. They're going to do tests on me. So I got to get prepped for that. I got to do this. I got to do that. Like, this is all the things that are going to happen to me. Right. So it's kind of like they throw all the stuff at you. Um, but you don't know when it's going to happen because this has got to happen. This has got to happen. You got to see this doc. You got to get these tests. You got to get those tests. You know, it's like, all right. So I just said yes to whatever, do whatever you guys got to do and let's go. So, I was being prepped for LVAD, right? Uh, first, had to have an LVAD implanted. So I had no idea what that was, no idea what the process was, whatever. So I'm just like, sure, do whatever you got to do. I already said, do whatever you got to do. Right, to save, save my, my life. life. So, yeah. so the LVAD rep, right, the device rep comes in to tell me about the device, right? right? So this isn't a nurse. This isn't a cardiologist. This is just a young lady that is an expert on this device, right? Mm -hmm. So she comes in and she starts telling me about the LVAD. So she's like, all right, so this is what's going to happen. Like, it's going to be implanted next to your heart. It's going to be here, and you're going to have wires up here in your chest, like your upper right your quadrant of your chest are going to have wires coming in. Then you're mm -hmm. going to have wires in your lower right abdomen uh, quadrant coming out, mm -hmm. and you're going to have a battery pack, and it's going to be, you know, your battery pack is going to be on, you know, 24-7, and this and that's going to charge the device or keep the device charged, whatever this and that. And she goes, she says, uh, she goes, well, they told me that you're a paramedic. She goes, so uh, I'm going to tell you this. She goes, I don't want you to ever feel for a pulse, for, for your own pulse. Right. So I go, all right. I go, well, why not? And she goes, you're not going to have one. Because it's not going to be there. <laughs> so I go, what? I go, hold on, ma'am. I go, yeah. what do you mean I'm not going to have a pulse? Like, yeah. that's creepy, you know? She goes, well, the device, it's just a constant flow. And, you know, it's just blood's going to be constantly going through this. And so she's like, so you won't get that pump of your heart, you know, so you won't feel a, a pulse, you yeah. know? And I go, well, what? 
I go, <laughs> what's my heart going to be doing at this time? You're like, why my heart's still going to be pumping, right? You know, mm-hmm. like beating, but this device is going to take over the flow of this. And she goes, well, she goes, what they do is she goes, they, 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 they're going to turn your heart off. I go, they're going to turn my heart off. I go, what do you mean they're going to turn my heart off? I go, when do they turn my heart back on? (laughs) And she goes, um, now she's confused. And I'm like, you know, she's like, I don't know. Uh, She goes, um, well, let me get back to you. They're not, they're not going to. What do you mean they're not going to? She's like, Mike, you're getting a new heart. Like you're having a heart transplant. I go, who the fuck decided uh, that? You said you said whatever you have but to do to keep me alive. One hundred percent. Little did I know what whatever to do to keep me alive is. Let's get this guy a new heart, right? Yeah. So I go, hold on. I go, who decided that? You did. And, yeah. And she goes, um, I'm gonna call your doctor. I go, yeah. You know what? Maybe get doctor over here real quick. You know. So he comes walking in. And he's like, Mike, what is the problem? What is going on here? I go, who? Dis- who said I'm getting a new heart? And he goes, we did. Like we decided. Like this is the the course of action. Is this 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 and that? You're getting a new heart. I go, hold on. Now, mind you, I'm in the ICU for a couple of days now. I feel two million times better, right? Yeah. The first night I was there with all the medications I was on and everything like that, I lost nine pounds from just fluid. From oh. I was going to the bathroom every 15 minutes. I was filling those urinals up, and it was like nonstop. Right? Outstanding. So I'm already feeling fantastic. So mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm like, a oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I go, I go, I'm 33 years old right now. Like to have a heart transplant, I go, how long do they last? Mm-hmm. You know, like you always think, at least I did, any organ transplants could be 10, 15 years, maybe, right. maybe 20 years at max. Like right. that would put me into the 55 year range. And then what? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Do I, do I get another, another one? one? Yeah. Do yeah. I get another one? And I'm like, you know what? I'm just not. Like, I, I was so concerned. All right. So, like I said before about the nerve graft, mm-hmm. right? With the cadaver nerve, mm-hmm. I didn't want a nerve of a dead guy in me. Now you got to tell you're telling me I got to take a heart, a whole nother heart, a whole heart. And he's like, Mike, this is this is it. This is procedure. Like this is what you need. Your heart's not healthy anymore. You're not. Your heart's not going to like. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I com- I'm not not saying what you're saying is correct. I go, but can we just? I go. I feel so much better. I go. Can we just hold off? Can we just not throw that LVAD in my chest today? Mm-hmm. Like, can we just? Maybe we'll see what the medicine does. You know, Mm -hmm. he's so frustrated. He's like, you know, just whatever. Mm -hmm. So he's like, I'm going to think about this for a little bit. You know, let me think about this. We'll see, you know, whatever the snap, blah, blah, whatever. So fortunately, I was able to, because he told me, he tells me I'm number one on the heart transplant list, right? Mm -hmm. And I was kind of like thinking to myself, in our profession, we know like it could, all it takes is one car accident right now. Yeah that a, a donor's heart is available and I'm going to the operating table and right. I got a new heart. Like right. uh, let's, whoa, yeah. like let's just, let's pump the brakes. Let's see, you know, so he leaves, he's all upset at me. My nurse comes in and she's like, what, Allah, what are you doing? You know, you're stupid. You know, <laughs> Oh, look at me. I'm 33. I'm a firefighter paramedic. I know everything, you know? And it's like, no, look, okay, true. But also yeah. like, just let's just pump the brakes a little bit. Right. Like, let's just not, Get crazy into like let's throw a, a new heart in this guy, right? Right. So everybody, it kind of like it killed the mood for the day, right? In a good way, in the, in my eyes, in a good way. But everybody was pissed at me now, right? No one wants to talk to me anymore, right? I'm still I'm getting a new nurse coming in every 15 minutes to check my vitals. I don't know who she was. Like I don't even know it was a nurse. <laughs> I think they just sent like environmental into my room to go go check that guy's vitals. We don't even care about this guy right now, you know. Not that they didn't care. They they cared, but. um You know, it just so then, of course, I get on in my own head and in my own emotions and feels, and I start looking up because I've heard stories like in the in the field, in the paramedic world, in the fire service world, you hear like crazy stories all the time, right? This has been a Fire and Iron Media production. You have something to say, people want to listen. How's that, Daddy? <laughs> <laughs>